Hi, this is Mark Birch, and I'm going to offer some quick analysis and revision of Patient Zakbabi's Eat Me, taken from the Forward Books of Poetry anthology, Poems of the Decade. The poem takes the form of a dramatic monologue, privileging the voice of the victim of a man who exerts his power over the poetic voice through excessive feeding. This builds a reliance on the man and allows him to gain sexual gratification through an obsession with weight. The first-person perspective creates a sympathy for the woman and an empathy for her state. The structure of the poem is particularly interesting. It's composed of ten regular tersets. And this regularity could mirror the regularity of consumption or symbolise the components of the relationship, man, woman and food. An unusual AAA rhyme scheme is employed throughout the poem, complementing the sense of regularity found in the stanza lengths. Rather than conventional rhymes, or even half rhymes, the lines are bound by assonance. For example, the long A sound in the first stanzas, cake, made, and weight. The rhyme scheme creates a sense of connection, but it's an unconventional and unnatural connection, perhaps representing the nature of the relationship between the man, woman, and food. Another phonological feature that acts as a structural device is the pattern of consonants that end each line. The final consonants of each line, of each terset, are k, followed by d, and finally t. There are only two notable exceptions in all ten stanzas. And once again, this reinforces the sense of regularity and control that characterises the feeding, but it also conveys a sense of harshness, given the hard consonant sounds that dominate. The metre could also represent the poem's narrative. The number of feet in each line increases as the poem progresses, just as the poetic voice's size increases. The first stanza is dominated by tetrameter, the second pentameter, the third hexameter. And while this is far from consistent, the sense of increase is difficult to ignore. The title could imply the allure of food for an obsessive eater. The food itself calls out to her, rendering the woman a submissive character who must respond to the imperative issued by the food itself. The title and the second stanza also act as an intertextual link to Alice in Wonderland. The cake in Alice in Wonderland is labelled Eat Me and has the effect of making Alice enormous. This is precisely, of course, the intention of the male character in the poem. The male character is never named. He brought me a cake. The anonymity of the character renders him a mysterious, frightening and threatening presence. That the cake is homemade may make it appear the product of a loving gesture, but the reader's expectation is soon undermined by the recognition that the scale and constituents of the cake are designed to fatten the poetic voice rather than being designed for her pleasure. Undermining a reader's expectation of positive domestic associations renders the cake and the male character all the more disturbing. And this is also present in the opening lines, When I Hit Thirty. The natural association is that a cake's being presented to celebrate a 30th birthday, but the shocking realisation that each candle represents a stone in weight reveals that this is a celebration of weight gain rather than a milestone in life, again making this a disturbing break with convention. The use of the verb hit has connotations of violence that may complement the sense that the weight gain is harming the poetic voice. Eating is revealed to be an act of submission rather than one of pleasure, as the woman states that she did what I was told, didn't even taste it. The male figure's control is made explicit in the third stanza. The woman's made to walk around the bed so that the man can watch for his sexual gratification. The woman is wholly objectified, and the weight that grants the man pleasure is represented through a range of devices. The consonance of plosives in broad belly wobble creates not only a sense of excess through the repetition, but also an explosion of sound that complements the massive nature of the woman's flesh. The repetition continues in the same line's use of alliteration in Judders Like a Juggernaut. This simile conveys the size of the woman through the denotation of juggernaut as a large lorry, but its etymology is also significant. The word juggernaut is derived from a Hindu festival where a huge chariot is paraded through the streets. There are many accounts of worshippers being crushed to death beneath the wheels of this enormous juggernaut, which could foreshadow the way in which the male figure is crushed beneath the body of the poetic voice at the end of the poem, dying beneath the object of his desire. The fourth stanza uses italics to represent the direct speech of the man. His desire is not specific to this woman, 
but to size. The repetition of girls reinforces the unspecific nature of his desire and therefore his contempt for the individual. The word girls also infantilizes the object of his desire, stripping women of their power as adults. The male voice is represented zoomorphically as a burrowing creature. Such creatures are usually small, with the contrast in size linking to the source of the man's sexual obsession. It's a deeply unpleasant image that may connote the cause of damage and pain for the poetic voice. The stanzas presented as an asyndetic list, conveying a sense of excess and endlessness. And this is supported by the use of adjectives of excess, multiple and bigger, as well as the noun masses. The cremomorphic metaphor, I was his jacuzzi, dehumanises the woman. She's merely an object for the man's pleasure. The metaphor also introduces the motif of water imagery. Initially, this imagery is associated with pleasure, but ultimately results in drowning. The simile like forbidden fruit to represent her increase in size may be read literally. Fruit is forbidden to her, as only fast food has the properties required to increase her size so dramatically. However, the phrase could also act as a biblical allusion to the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that God forbids Adam and Eve to eat from. Genesis states, In the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And if the poetic voice is being compared to the fruit of this tree, it may foreshadow the death of the man who figuratively devours this fruit. The alliteration in forbidden fruit could once again convey excess, and this is compounded by the following lines, his breadfruit, given that the morpheme fruit is repeated. A breadfruit is very large, and the yield of the breadfruit tree is very high, representing once again huge size. Stanza 6 is dominated by sea imagery. Well, initially this is comforting, with the poetic voice representing herself as a safe haven, a desert island after shipwreck. Although even here, there's a sense of disaster. Both the desert island and the extended metaphor of the beached whale that follows this are large, and both are represented as stranded. It's clear in the next stanza that the poetic voice is too fat to leave the house, and stranded, therefore, seeking escape. She is craving a wave. The stanza ends with the poetic voice transformed into a tidal wave of flesh, something enormous and potentially dangerous, whether that danger is foreshadowing the danger she poses to the man or the danger that her excessive weight poses to herself. Stanza 6 is the only stanza not to be end-stopped, and it's the first stanza to break the pattern of final consonants of lines ending in kurt de and then t. Here we have kurt de sh. The tidal wave of flesh is not restricted by this patterning, but effectively breaks over the line only to reach its fulfilment after the stanza enjambment with the t in two. The adverb to, meaning excessively, is repeated four times in stanza seven, and it's followed by four uses of the preposition to. Together, these words are overwhelming, as is the fat that's also repeated six times. The asyndetic list that structures the seventh stanza again conveys excess, as it suggests endlessness. The euphemisms that conclude the stanza are overwhelmed by the references to fat and the sense of excess throughout the stanza. It's clear that a euphemism such as cuddly cannot withstand the undeniable display of excessive weight. Stanza 8 begins with another milestone, the day I hit 39. But gone is any pretense of pleasure for the fed poetic voice. Instead of a cake, she has olive oil poured down her throat, an image that's reminiscent of gavage, the force feeding of animals through a tube down the throat. The poetic voice's cheek is a globe, a hyperbolic metaphor that suggests her enormous size through the connotations of the planet. The syntactic parallelism in his flesh, my flesh, creates a connection that structurally mirrors the physical connection between the man and woman, as the intimacy of touching her cheek appears to lead to sex. The connection is strengthened by the alliteration of f that flows across the line. The use of the verb flowed reintroduces the motif of water that continues into the next stanza's use of rolled and drowned. She acts as the tidal wave that rolls over the man, literally killing him. Agababi captures the massive effort of rolling over through both lexical repetition and the long assonance of O that dominates the second line of the stanza. This action seems to be an intentional response to the man's whispered, soon you'll be 40. The abuse has to stop and this milestone acts as a catalyst for agency. I drowned his dying sentence out, 
acts as a homographic pun. The sentence could refer to the words of the man as he dies. The poetic voice's flesh drowns out or silences the man's dying words. Hence the ellipsis after the italics representing the man's words. Alternatively, sentence could refer to a judgment. The poetic voice has passed her sentence on the man, a death sentence. The final stanza consists of three end-stopped lines, reinforcing the sense of finality. It's the end of the man, the woman's intake of food, and her dependence on the man. The first line focuses on the passage of time. The six hours that felt like a week may be the result of lying next to a corpse, something horrific that's likely to make time feel like it's passing incredibly slowly. However, this same effect could be a result of not having eaten for six hours. The poetic voice is used to eating constantly, and the dragging of time may not be related to the corpse. Ironically, the dead man is represented as a figure of greed, with his mouth slightly open, as if awaiting food, and his eyes bulging with greed. The final line can be read in a number of ways. An optimistic interpretation is that the poetic voice is now freed from her reliance on food as there was nothing else left in the house to eat. However, it seems more compelling to read the line as an ironic and befitting end for the man. His corpse is the only thing left in the house to eat. The cannibalism of the poetic voice transforms the feeder into the food. Okay, top.